Good God, absolutely nothing. It's the futility of war, celebrated here on NES Works Guide In episode 52. <laughs> The last episode focused on games about transforming robots. This episode focuses on games about war. And as with those games, these are pretty meager examples of the form. Well, mostly. We begin with Kemco's first game for Famicom, Doughboy. Now we've seen Kemco already on NES Works, and the games we've seen there simply continue the trend established here with this debut title. That is, unpleasant conversions of Western PC games. The original Doughboy debuted on Commodore 64 back in 1982, published by Synapse Software. It evidently began life as a one-man project designed and programmed by Ken Coates, who would go on to create a handful of puzzle, simulation, and strategy games. Doughboy kind of qualifies as all of these, though at the same time it also plays kind of like a military shooter. In short, it does a lot of things all at once, and while I can't necessarily say that it sticks the landing on any of them, it certainly does present a more complex sandbox than other shooters at the time. But maybe complex isn't the word so much as complicated. Doughboy wants you, the player, to do a lot of things by way of a limited, not to mention awkward, interface. Doughboy initially appears to be a simple shooter in the vein of Frontline. Rather than scrolling upward, however, you need to reach the far right of the screen. The battlefield spans about two screens width, pockmarked by trenches that house enemies who emerge to take pot shots at you. Trees and rocks litter the landscape, offering both you and your foes limited cover from one another's fire. You have the ability to move and fire in eight directions, a skill shared by the opposing army's troopers as well. We've seen flimsier pretexts for a game on Famicom to date, but perhaps none executed quite so poorly as this one. Kemco, or rather Kotobuki system at this point, woke up one morning and decided that for their first ever video game release, they would set the low bar of playability on Famicom. A terrible choice in my opinion, but so bold that you almost have to respect it. Doughboy controls horribly, with sluggish response time that makes it difficult to take aim toward an oncoming enemy without walking face first into their projectiles. At the same time, your character moves in a jumpy way, seeming to be effectively locked to the system's 8x8 tile grid, which makes it difficult to position him in a delicate or precise way. I said that you can use the rocks and trees that dot the landscape, but nah, trying to line yourself up between an object in a way that largely blocks incoming fire while providing you with a clear line of sight for your own attacks just doesn't happen here. Trying to duck and cover mostly just causes you to become tangled up on corners, leaving you vulnerable to attack. It's not great. Instead, you're meant to collect the various items that appear around the battlefield – wire cutters, detonator cables, plastique, etc. – while evading the opposing army's fire. Reach the right side of the screen, and you move along to a second stage crisscrossed by rivers. Here, you'll die almost instantly, as there appears to be no way to cross the rivers, which instantly drown you. At this point, Doughboy's complications come into play, as you need to employ all the tools you collected in the first level. The waterways are lined with what appear to be radar stations, but I guess are actually meant to be drawbridges. You need to jump into the submenu and select tools that will allow you to knock down these bridges, which will then give you the ability to cross safely over the water. The ambiguity created by Doughboy's inscrutable graphical elements aside, this doesn't work anywhere near as well as it should, because the menus behave as clumsily as the combat controls. Fumbling through the menus takes some effort, and even once I selected what I thought were the proper tools, it didn't seem to have any luck using them. Maybe Kemco bit off more than it could chew here, attempting to convert a somewhat intricate crossover-style game from a computer to a less capable console. Not that I'll ever be able to see anything beyond that. I just don't have the time or patience to deal with this unspeakable mess of a conversion when I could be spending the precious moments of my life doing literally anything else. That didn't deter Kemco, though. It somehow survived this tragedy and go on to publish a variety of other Western PC conversions of varying quality. Eventually they'd get it right with Shadowgate, and it would only take four years of this nonsense. Another NES heavy hitter makes its meager debut here. Yes, that's right, it's Capcom and Micronix with 1942. Yes, Capcom has arrived, and like several other fledgling Famicom developers, they've chosen to enter the market by relying on Micronix to sort things out for them. Not the best idea, but understandable. After all, 
Capcom only had a year of game development under their belt at this point. Established in 1983, Capcom shipped its first four arcade titles in 1984, including 1942 here. As a small, scrappy startup, we can reasonably surmise that the company simply didn't have the manpower to make its own console conversion jet. And so they sent a check to Micronix and received, in return, a passable but uninspiring rendition of their international arcade hit. The Famicom certainly didn't lack for vertical shooters at this point. 1942 is something like the sixth of these games since Zevius arrived a little more than a year prior. To be honest, you'd be hard-pressed to call any of them particularly inspiring. Aside from Star Force and Zevius, they've all tended to suffer from spotty technical performance and repetitive actions and enemy patterns. To its credit, 1942 does at least mix things up. It incorporates a simple power-up system that allows players to beef up their plane with extra firepower in the form of tiny companionships that you can sacrifice to absorb a stray shot from enemy fire. And with its martial World War II theme, it offers a nice break from the abstract alien fighters seen in Star Force or Zuno Senkan Galg. Everything you fight here resembles some sort of real-world fighter craft. And despite the thematic uniformity this creates, 1942 does at least do a lot of different things with these planes. You have small jets that swoop in singly, formations that perform aerial maneuvers in unison, and dogfighters that careen around in circular patterns. Mid-sized bombers cruise in from the bottom of the screen before taking up position just ahead of your plane to open fire from their tail guns. Large carriers occupy a significant portion of the screen, boxing you in while soaking up damage. And lines of orange planes dart in, daring you to take them all out and rewarding you with power-ups if you do. Granted, none of this prevents the game from becoming incredibly tiresome, as you make your way through a few dozen stages that all consist of aerial combat over the Pacific against increasingly aggressive Japanese warplanes. And it certainly doesn't alleviate the choppy animation and incessant irritation of the so-called soundtrack, which appears to be an attempt to combine Morse code, military snare drums, and a brutal psyops assault on your mind all at the same time. This may be a shaky conversion of a popular arcade title, but it lands a little differently on Famicom than it would a year later on NES. In America, 1942 arrived hot on the heels of two dozen rock-solid first-party releases. Here in Japan, however, it's maybe the least offensive floater bobbing along on a rising tide of crap. And finally, the least loved game in this entire batch. But is that entirely fair? Most Americans know Bokoska Wars from the early days of emulation, where they would run through ROM lists and try every game for about 15 seconds. And this game made the worst possible impression. If Doughboy refuses to make its intentions and requirements clear to players as its levels unfold, Bokoska Wars stubbornly plants its feet in the ground, crosses its arms, and doggedly shuts down all efforts to understand it within its first five seconds. The average person's first experience with Bokoska Wars consists of taking control of your character, walking a few tiles to the left in order to confront the first foe you spot, and promptly receiving an instant game over. By these appearances, Bokoska Wars has no redeeming qualities whatsoever, with primitive-looking graphics and impossible challenge level, and no opportunities for interaction whatsoever besides walking and dying. This looks, on its surface, to be the single worst thing to have appeared on Famicom to date. And yet, these looks deceive. I wouldn't call Bokoska Wars a timeless classic, but it has merit. It represents an attempt to streamline a genre into another format altogether, placing it into the same category as the likes of Portopia, and yes, the Tower of Draga. It makes for an interesting counterpoint to Doughboy, as both games share a lot of elements in common. Both originally debuted on personal computers, in this case Sharp X1 rather than Commodore 64, and both were created by a single person, in this case Koji Sumi. Both attempt to wrangle complex play concepts into the limited framework of early PCs and of course the Famicom. And where Doughboy sees you advancing left to right across a battlefield, Bokoska Wars sends you in the reverse direction. The two games almost work as complements or mirror images of the other. And yet, I would call Bokoska Wars a success rather than the failure that Doughboy is, but for subtle reasons. Now, I'm no damn good at either of these games, but if you were to demand I master one of them, I'd go with Bokoska Wars hand down. With his creation, Sumi attempted to transform a real-time strategy game into an arcade-friendly title that controls with a D-pad and two buttons. 
You need to lead an army into combat across an immense battlefield, breaking through enemy lines and taking the battle to an evil warlord. And you need to do all of this despite the fact that your only commands consist of movement and a character selection toggle. Okosuka Wars makes no sense until it does, at which point it clicks and becomes, if not a breeze, then at least coherent. It starts as the most simplistic game you can possibly imagine, and grows in complexity as you advance, developing its rhythms and requirements in a way that allows you to come to terms with its workings along a natural learning curve. This gives it a real advantage over Doughboy, which dumps a lot of elements into your lap all at once and expects you to just figure them out. Okosuka Wars, on the other hand, really only requires you to know a single unintuitive detail. If you bump into certain trees and rocks on the battlefield, you'll liberate soldiers who join your party and fight alongside your king, a feature curiously unique to the Famicom port. In all versions of the game, though, you need to guide a party that contains three different classes of warrior, the singular king, a simple soldier, and a powerful knight. As in chess, the soldiers and knights have an expendable nature, but if your king dies, the game ends on the spot and seems very excited about it, exclaiming, wow, you lose. What you can't immediately tell from a glance at Bokoska War's primitive visuals is that each of these warrior types has the ability to grow in power by earning combat experience. When one of your units makes contact with an enemy sprite, they automatically enter combat together. If your unit emerges victorious, it grows in power. These mechanics may sound familiar. This sort of abstract auto-combat would appear later in games like Nintendo's still unlocalized Game Boy Adventure for the Frog the Belt Holes. And this particular take on combat units gaining power and leveling up through a victory would become a fixture of the Mystery Dungeon series in which monsters can rank up by killing other creatures. I wouldn't make some ridiculous claim here that Bokoska Wars deserves a place in the pantheon of all-time influential games or anything like that. Rather, I'd wager that Sumi simply drew inspiration from the same primordial stew that was informing other games of the time, like Rogue and Hydelide. Heck, Bokoska Wars looks like it should play like Hydelide or Dragon Slayer, but it abstracts its bump combat even more than those games did, refusing to offer anything so useful as life meters or stat readings. You should instead think of it more like a rough precursor to Populous, in which you guide units and they kind of do their own thing. As your units grow in power, they rank up to different colors and can brace against more challenging foes. And yeah, as in games like Fire Emblem, losing a unit that you've invested effort into really sucks and instantly tilts the odds against you. To put it in Warcraft terms, the king functions as your hero unit. Yes, losing your king ends the game, but as his vassals take down enemies, he grows in strength and endurance. Although he can't survive a direct encounter at the game's outset, he becomes a useful and durable participant to pit against certain enemies at key moments. Again, none of this is really explained. Okoska Wars makes up for its simplicity by placing the burden of learning entirely on the player's shoulders. And yeah, that means there's some trial and error at work here. But the simulation grows in complexity as you make your way across the 600 meters of turf between your starting point and the enemy warlord's domain. You need to figure out the specialties of each character type, like the fact that knights can break down walls and liberate soldiers from prisons. You need to know when to control a single unit type and when to move your entire army in unison. As with so many early computer games, Bokoska Wars is about gaining hard-fought experience and losing all your progress in an instant as you make a mistake, then starting over and trying something different the next time, with no guarantee that this revised approach will yield better results. As such, I don't know that I could call Bokoska Wars a must-play game, but it does have a certain compelling something about it. Although I constantly made a hash of my playthroughs for this recording, I keep thinking of ways I could approach it differently, meaning it's a real brainworm of a game. Certainly I'm not alone here, since Bokoska Wars has retained enough of a following to merit a sequel in 2016, more than 30 years after its debut. Honestly, this makes for one of the more fascinating artifacts of the early Famicom era, a ferocious game that has no interest in greeting you with welcoming arms, one eclipsed by countless subsequent games that outclassed it with its own concepts but nevertheless infinitely less dire than first impressions would suggest. Next time on NES Works Guide In, Hudson offers a moment's reprieve from the Famicom's downward spiral.